When analyzing Odo and doing a true character analysis of the individual, you almost have to break down the different archetypes of the writing itself. I'm going to ask for a bit of patience from you as I feel I really do need to briefly discuss the different type of character levels so that I can better show just how spectacularly written Odo was. To do this, I'm going to touch on Cynthia Whitcomb's The Levels of Characters Evolution in her book The History of Film. She has expanded on this some, but the original basics are simply that there are six levels of a character from zero to five. Level one is the basic loner that has a hard time interacting and may or may not do something horrible to a large group of people, while level five is someone that cares more about an idea or religion over everything else. Generally, level zero, one, four, and five are either heroes with extreme flaws or simply villains. Level two, being a focus on one person or a small group, and level three, caring for a specified group and being a part of a family, is where you ideally want your heroes to be or where they need to move to. So with that in mind, if I had to classify Odo in the beginning, I would argue that he starts out as a level four character that moves into a level three that cared about his family on DS9 and Starfleet, and possibly argue a level two, three mix with Kira Norris. Let's more dig into it. Odo was found in the Denobulus Belt, or at least his gelatinous form was. He would be brought back to a Bajoran science lab, which is interesting given how we know that this was either during or just barely before the occupation. The fact that the Cardassians would allow Bajorans to continue their science endeavors is kind of confusing and something we'll explore at some point. Either way, the future constable would be given a name that is very apt for his character level. Odo Itanal, meaning literally nothing in Cardassian. We'll discuss more on that later. Not realizing that he was doing harm, a Bajoran scientist by the name of Mora Pohl tortured Odo inadvertently in an attempt to understand what was before him. It wasn't until Odo formed into a hand and slapped the scientist and then mimicked a beaker exactly did the Bajoran realize that he was dealing with sentient life. Pohl would work with Odo, helping him to learn how to change into different objects and even personas. Odo would ultimately leave the science lab and make his way for Deep Space Nine. His time with the scientist would be critical though. As stated, he was given the name Odo Intal by Cardassians because they thought he was nothing. He would shorten this name to Odo and keep it, believing that it was true that he was nothing. He came from nowhere. He had no real origin story, and so he would be an outsider. This was his defining trait. On the station, Odo became known for being incredibly neutral in most all affairs, often settling disputes between Bajoran workers. His reputation would grow so much that Gul Dukat took notice of him. After doing several jobs for the dictator, including one where he exonerated a very guilty Kira Norris, the changeling was made chief of security. I won't delve too much into it at this time, but it speaks to Odo's abilities that xenophobic Cardassians choose him to head security. His ability to be impartial and to run the station efficiently garnered him respect from both the Cardassians and the Bajorans. This is why I felt so important to discuss the character levels before at the top. Cardassians, Bajorans, humans, Federation, None of it mattered to him at this stage. He was focused on order, focused on law. Certainly, I don't think he enjoyed Cardassian justice upon the Bajorans, but ultimately he just wanted everyone to go to their corners and play nice, as any outsider would. Though, this focus didn't mean he wasn't above getting his hands somewhat dirty, as Odo did happen to garner debts and a network within the Cardassian Union, during his time on Tarek Nor. Ironically, while I speak negatively of stage four characters and their development, it would be Odo's godlike ability of staying neutral that probably allowed him to keep his post as security chief when the Cardassians are pushed out and the Federation comes in. Which is intriguing since technically Odo is a Cardassian collaborator, but we're not gonna go too much into that right now. I guess if I'm going to be fair, and it is going to be brought up in the comments, there was a point where Odo would fall short of the glory by being overworked and simply apathetic. So much so to the point that innocent people would lose their lives. I'm going to say this though, if Odo worked so closely with pure evil, with the Cardassians, and that was his only malfeasance, assuming we remove the fact that he didn't fight back against the Cardassians of course, then I think that his record is pretty untarnished. 
When the Cardassians withdrew, Starfleet did take over Tarak Nor and renamed it Deep Space Nine. I've discussed this a little bit. Odo, probably by the request of the provisional government, I imagine, was allowed to keep his position as station security. While some resources state that Odo is never given an official rank, I wonder if the title Constable is some form of rank by the Bajorans. This makes the most sense as we see him give orders to both Bajorans and Starfleet personnel in relation to security matters. He also had deputies, which would make me think that perhaps his post was given to him by popular demand, and it's similar to how we see deputies work in the United States, specifically to counties. While I could go through every single event involving Odo, it makes more sense to simply discuss the highlights and major impacts that were done upon Odo and by Odo. After all, this is an analysis, not a point-by-point -point breakdown. Before I get into this, let me know what episodes or events you think were pivotal for Odo, either for him or for the others by him. But for me, these instances include when Odo was able to determine the crew had been taken over by energy spheres and was able to trick the doctor into freeing his comrades on the station before any death occurred. Additionally, in 2370, when Odo was able to determine that the Circle, a Bajoran nationalist and terrorist group, was conspiring with Cardassians, and by doing this, he was able to help prevent them from overthrowing the Bajoran government. We'd also see in the future Odo use his status within the Cardassian courts to slow proceedings down so that Sisko could prove the innocence of Miles O'Brien, who had been found guilty of joining the Maquis and using Starfleet resources to aid them. And on a side note, let me stop here for a second because I think this episode is of particular note due to the fact that we have Odo standing up for an individual. Though you could argue he cared more about the laws and justice, it does show a glimpse of whom he is on the inside, that he does start to care about people. He would also continue to keep order and ensure the safety of the station from here on out. Though, while we do get glimpses, as I've noted, we don't see the beginnings of a major shift until Odo discovers the Omerian Nebula. This would be where he found his people, specifically the founders who controlled all of the Dominion. They would admit to him that he was sent out with up to a hundred other baby changelings to discover the universe and report back. They do state that they didn't expect him specifically to return until the 27th century. I find this odd, honestly. Given how much the Founders care about their own, it really seems out of character for them to send changelings in such a vulnerable state out into the ether and just hope that they make it back. But again, that'll be a discussion for another time. The shifts in movement in Odo from one character level to another could be blatantly seen here as he chooses the crew of Deep Space Nine over his people and they are allowed to return home. While the Founders offered something that he always wanted, order and strength along with a sense of being, Odo turns away from them and ultimately sides with the Federation. It's at this point that we do begin to see the rumblings of the Dominion Cold War. Interestingly, this set of proxy conflicts would see Odo relegated to the background, though there are a few notable exceptions. This included when Odo was able to catch and kill a changeling who was posing as Ambassador Krajinsky in an attempt to start a war with the Zinkethi, as well as when he agreed to assist Sisko and Admiral Layton in preparing defenses for Starfleet against the Dominion. Ironically, it would be at this time when he decided to not follow order and to defend his friends, to go with the shift, that he is betrayed and likely infected by Starfleet and made a type of typhoid Mary carrying the morphogenic virus. As Odo continued to move away from his beliefs in law and order and more towards his family and their cause, his people would decide to judge him for what he had done to the other changeling. Somehow they would infect him and make him sick, forcing him to be brought back to the Great Link. The Great Link would stand in judgment of him, turning him into a human permanently, because founders can do that, I guess and tricking him into thinking that the head of the Klingon Empire was in fact a changeling himself. The now solid detective would fall for the trick and let the Federation know what was occurring. Odo would be chosen to be a part of an assassination squad, because that makes sense for Starfleet, to go and kill Galron. Oh, they'd say that they were trying to show that he was a changeling, but ultimately they were going to kill him. They were going to kill him dead. During that operation, the detective determines that the real changeling was, in fact, Martok. After showing the Empire that they had been deceived, the assassination squad would be allowed to return back to DS9. This is where Odo would have a very tough time to adjusting to being a solid. Of course, it wouldn't last for long as Odo and Pol find a baby changeling that they unfortunately aren't able to nurse back to health. The baby would give its life and link with Odo, giving him back his abilities to morph. 
And it would be at this time where the Dominion Cold War heats up and why we'll be pausing in the breakdown. I know that I've effectively been giving a brief synopsis of what occurred with Odo, which might be confusing or seem dismissive because of how fast I'm going. However, the point of the character analysis is to look at the character as I've discussed, not necessarily what they've done. Everything I've covered up to now is, in my opinion, the first arc of Odo. In Campbell's hero's journey that we see when we discuss the monomyth theory, a character starts out in an ordinary world with a deep flaw that he has to overcome, where the hero has to change. The flaw that I've been describing in Odo is, honestly, it's all in his name. Remember, Odo is shorthand for nothing. That's how Odo saw himself, as literally nothing. He had no friends, no culture, no allegiances. That's what Odo thought. A large part of his story up to this point has been an emphasis on that. During this time, we would see pieces, points where Odo shows who he could be, that he's more than just the sum of his parts, that he's more than nothing. But that was kind of the point of the entire first arc. Odo is slowly starting to realize that he isn't nothing. He isn't a neutral bystander. He's a part of something. He has a choice and agency and people that care for him. He has two sides to him that are drawing him in both directions. He can't any longer be neutral, even if he continually tries to be, even up to this point. While I do understand that he does assist the Federation and Starfleet in attempting to fight the Dominion, he never really truly is on Starfleet's side at this point. Remember, he wants to return home, he wants to be with his people. So he's trying his best to be both and none at the same time. And because of how great the storytelling is, how great the actor is, up to this point, we can sympathize with what he's going through. And it would be the friendships that he made during this time and after with Sisko, Bashir, Jedzia, and others. It would be his mutual understanding and respect for Garrick. It would be his rivalry and great friendship with Quark that would turn him into something new. Stay tuned as we watch the second part of this arc. We watch someone who tried to stay as nothing ultimately become something. And in doing so, save countless lives and end the war in the process. It'd be ironic that a person whose name literally meant nothing became something quite special. Stay tuned as we discuss it on the next Lore Reloaded.